Hello everyone, thanks for joining me. Again, I know lots of folks don't necessarily come on live, but I do see some folks coming on live, so that's great. Uh, first things first, I want to thank you all for the positive feedback. I do know a lot of people don't watch live, um, so I don't always get a lot of comments during the during the uh, live stream, but uh, later I get uh, private messages. Some folks aren't comfortable putting it on the public comments. That's okay too. Um, so thanks again. I didn't realize, um, didn't know how uh, well this would go uh, as we got started a couple months ago, um, but so far it's going great. And it breaks up my day a little bit um, and gives me something to look forward to. So I hope uh, you do as well. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the library. And uh, this comes from the article I wrote last week for the Easter Advertiser. As many of you know, I do a, a monthly column uh, for the Advertiser. And I always am intrigued by interesting topics. Um, I have more topics than I have time to write. A lot of people give me great ideas, and I don't have time to write about them all. Um, so they kind of go in the hopper. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, the research, I'm, I'm, I do research on all sorts of things. And then um, hopefully uh, it comes together in an article. And one of the things I like to do is uh, um, commemorate uh, anniversaries. So um, f the article I wrote last week, and if you didn't have a chance to read it, and it's in the current paper, um, so the one that came out last Thursday, and uh, if you didn't have a chance um, or get to read that um, in the actual edition of the newspaper, I will be posting that. I'll share it um, on, in the comments here on this page as well. I like to give the advertiser a week just to have sort of the exclusive of the article, and then I'll share it, you know, outside of the advertiser. So I'll put a link to um, a copy of that article this week. But the article was about the, it's actually the 100th anniversary right about now, actually this week, that uh, the East Aurora Library moved into its own building um, at the cor corner of Maine and Whaley. And the what happened was, is they had this library, we're going to talk about this in a bit because that's the whole topic for today. But the library had formed as an organization in 1920 and they were looking, they, they were so successful, they got so many books donated and had so many people patronizing the library that they needed more room. They were in this, this small room in what was then known as the Board of Trade building, which was an old house, um, basically the precursor to the Chamber of Commerce, and they had their headquarters at the corner of Main and Payne, where the police station is today. And they quickly outgrew that um, that facility. So they were looking for, two years later, they were looking for a new home, a permanent home, a building. But as anyone who's gone searching for real estate, um, even back then, you would know that um, it was hard to find a prime spot. So out of, essentially out of nowhere, uh, Mrs. Evelyn Griggs, who was the widow of um, Abbott Griggs, who had made money as a banker, he was the mayor, um, he was involved in a lot of business um, ventures in East Aurora, and she had this money, and she donated the money, well, she didn't donate the money, she actually bought the house, um, the old Pratt house it was called, and then uh, wait, Mr. Whaley had bought it, and in 1922, um, in the spring, she announces um, that she bought the house and that it, she was donating it to the library for a permanent library. And that was a huge burden taken off the, the library uh, committee back then, all volunteers, um, because they didn't have to worry about finding a location and paying for the location, paying for the building. They just had to raise money for other things, converting it into the library and things like that. So the library in that building, which is not the building that is there today, but um, it's on the same spot that our library is um, today. So we've had a library there at that corner. Um, for 100 years. And that library, there wasn't an official um, ribbon cutting opening of that new library, but it did occur, um, according to the news accounts, um, it, within this week, the last week of November of 1922. So we're celebrating the centennial of our library having a permanent home at the corner of Maine and Whaley. So I thought that was quite um, interesting. And the reason I wrote that article to match the anniversary and why we're uh, talking about it today. But as I was thinking about, um, and I'll let you read the article, I don't have to repeat everything that's in there, but as I was doing the research on this topic, on our library and the library um, opening here in East Aurora, 
I discovered, and I guess I knew this, but I just never appreciated it, I guess. We just take for granted that when, that we can just walk into the library and everything there is free. Now, of course, it's not free. Our tax dollars support it. Um, a friends group supports a lot of things that happen in the library. Thank you to the friends. But um, anybody, regardless of their background, regardless of um, their income, uh, can go into the library. And um, if, of course, if you're not like me, where they, you know, had kept track of my fines and I had a fine and I couldn't check out a book. But anyway, I got that cleared up and now <laughs> you could get books freely. But the idea of going into a library and being able to read whatever's on the shelves, newspapers, today there's DVDs, uses use of computers, um, regardless of your background what or your income or your economic status, um, to go into a library and have that service available to you. Um, we take that for granted. I can just walk up to the library in any town and walk in and um, I'm, I am free to use the library and the services that they offer and learn um, and also programming and things like that. That wasn't always the case and I was um, quite surprised to learn and I, I knew this but I never appreciate I didn't really appreciate it until I read about it again is that the concept of a free library is fairly new. Um, in fact, um, in the we had libraries here in East Aurora, and I'll talk about East Aurora, but this is probably the case in a lot of towns, um, is they would have what were called social libraries or subscription libraries. So actually, we were quite early um, in this in East Aurora, where there was this group called the Aurora Union Library, and actually it was in 1824, which is quite early. Um, about 20 years after the first pioneer uh, settler of European descent uh, arrived here in our community, 1824, a group including Calvin Fillmore, a Fillmore family, um, and a, a, another a couple other men got together and they wanted to form this library. But the key difference is it was only for people who could pay $2 a year. So you could you pay a fee of $2, which was a lot of money, and then you could have the rights and privileges of reading uh, books or other things that they could purchase with that money. And it was basically a closed organization. Uh, you'd pay the, the subscription and then you could go in and read um, the books. And they would decide which books they would get and they could, you know, it was basically a fraternal organization. And, and the uh, organizers of the Ad Original Library, the Union Library, according to our records um, that we have, it were all men, which is going to be a key, there's going to be a key point when we talk about the later libraries. So we had libraries, but they were subscription based or part of a church. A church would have a reading room or a small library or a, a fraternal organization in the community would have its own uh, private library and you would have to pay or be a member of that organization in order to take part in that library. Well, um, the, some uh, things changed a little bit after the Civil War, and there was this movement called the Free Library Movement, and you'll hear that too. You sometimes, um, and I won't get into details about what makes a library a diff, you know, why they call it a free library versus a public library or subscription library. Um, uh, even today, we have different libraries are set up differently in different areas of the country, even in different areas of the state, depending on how they're organized and incorporated. But essentially, you had libraries that you paid for and libraries that were open and free, and we didn't have a free library. Um, and so around the late 1800s, 1890s, uh, groups of people in local communities started thinking, well, we really need a free library that's open to all. Yes, we have these great um, private libraries, but they don't they don't do what libraries should do, and that is provide a mode of education for everybody, not just a select few people and people who probably, let's be frank, already had education <laughs> and were just reading um, things more for maybe pleasure or business, and not people who may have needed to be able to do th to to benefit the most from having a free and open library. So um, across the country, there was an effort, and even in New York, um, th there was an effort to start 
free and open libraries in small communities. And you can go into any community and research their library, and they probably um, have a story similar to ours. Ours was a little bit later, so the school had a library. The high school on uh, Main Street had a library um, that, according to some accounts, the public could use, uh, but it wasn't the same as a public open library, especially when it came to preschool children and adults. Um, so it wasn't free and open to everyone. Um, but we did have a school library. And actually, there's a story we'll talk about in a bit about uh, when I said we might have time to talk about book banning. And there's a great story, but that involves the school library, that the story that I know of. Um, so... Out of this movement for free libraries, and um, uh, you you got um, groups that got together and said they tried to raise money in order to have a community public library. And the interesting part of this, the subscription libraries that were popular earlier on, and even into the late 1800s, um, they were run a lot of times by men. Well, in this case, uh, in East Aurora, there was a group called the College Club and they got together, um, they were around in the late 1910s, um, so after World War I is when this effort started, and they would put on plays, uh, they would put on shows, variety shows, and they were, their purpose, um, main purpose when they first, when they formed was to um, form a free public library free being right in the right in the title and the state actually set up a system where you could have a free library um, for the community so that's what they were doing and communities across New York State across the country were doing this um, a free library movement where the concept before was a subscription based uh, library so if you didn't have a book your children could get books in school perhaps but if you didn't have a book in your house you couldn't go get it um, very easily unless you bought it um, so that free library um, idea came out of, and it's interesting, the timing, okay? So here in East Aurora, it was 1920, uh, uh, maybe earlier in the, um, in the 1900s, late 1800s. Well, what was happening at the same time? Well, women were becoming more involved in politics and actually were granted the right to vote in many areas, including New York State in 1917. And women had always been um, involved more in the, in the school. So in fact, in some places, uh, in education. So in some places, women could vote for school board but not for president or uh, local town board elections. So they were given the, you know, they were seen as qualified to vote in school elections, but not other elections. So women were part of this educational, um, uh, a part of the educational community and leadership positions in education um, uh, where they were not necessarily permitted in other areas. Um, so so they actually, this group of women from the college club, went around um, raising money. And they actually physically went door to door, and they formed an organization separated from the college club for the library. And they raised the money. They actually went to the village board and asked for public funding of the library. And they would pay for books and shelves, and they had that small room in the, in the Board of Trade building. Now... Today, we just take for granted that you can walk into the library and if they, even if they don't have a book on the shelf, they can help you find it. <laughs> um, we have a system in place where you can go re request a book from another library. Um, but this concept was pretty new, was very new and somewhat controversial. Um, some folks you'll read, the, that's why we call it a movement. You're like a free library movement. Well, why would we need a movement? We should just have a library. We take for granted today that we have a library. It was quite progressive. The idea that everyone should have access to books and reading materials and programming. Um, that was a fairly new concept. And you'll read um, debates, not necessarily in East Aurora's newspapers, but nation nationwide, if you read in other um, places of how far education should go, you know, and um, whether, you know, how far public education should go. Another interesting timing thing with this is uh, 
it goes hand in hand between the library's educational efforts and public school educational efforts. We didn't always see high school as a public, a public service. Today we go through 12th grade, taxpayer dollars pay for a public school to pay for through 12th grade. Well, we didn't do that in the early days. We had common schools like one-room schoolhouses throughout the community, throughout the rural areas even. And high school, East Aurora High School, the, the, the district as a um, union district, you'll see union free school district, just like a free library. Um, the, it wasn't that there's, it's not because there's no union, employee unions in the school district. <laughs> um, I always tell folks, put a little comma between union and free. So in the 1880s, the voters of East Aurora, the village, decided to combine two of those one-room schoolhouses, one on the east end of the village and one on the west end, and form the Union Free School District. Union District, comma, free. Free education. You don't have to pay for it. Because before that, to go to high school in East Aurora was the Aurora Academy. And that was in the same place that the uh, middle school is today, former high school at Maine and North Grove. Uh, you could go to high school, but you had to pay for it. And they would teach Greek and uh, romance, la other romance languages and uh, literature and, and things like that. Um, but it was for people, families who could afford it. So many times, uh, the students, most of the students at the Aurora Academy were not from East Aurora. They would travel in from other places and it would be families that could afford it. So in the 1880s, there was a movement um, to provide a high school education, um, at least for those two school, those small little districts in the village, and then gradually more school districts joined it. Um, but that concept of, uh, yeah, you get to go to high school for free, um, or taxpayers pay you. So regardless of your economic status, you, you get an education through 12th grade. That concept came around in the 1880s, not before that, you, if you could make it through the eighth grade if you had a school near you. But even after that, um, I have relatives in my family back 1920s who didn't get to go to high school because, not because they weren't smart enough to go, they just couldn't get there. There wasn't a train that would take them there, public transportation. But at least we had the concept beginning in the 1880s of public school education, so through 12th grade. So that happens, well, so out of that movement, is a movement for public free libraries in here in East Aurora as well. So um, th they weren't all these movements weren't happening in a vacuum. Um, the idea of public education, whether it was in a in a public school district or through a library where you had um, free books and other resources, newspapers, magazines, all those things that would have been in a library similar to what is in a library today. Of course, they didn't have computers and DVDs, but um, educational materials, that concept was seen as very progressive back at the time. So they had to basically convince the groups that wanted to do this in towns across the country, convince the voters who would be publicly supporting a public free library um, that it's a good idea, that having an uh, open uh, library for people to educate themselves was a, um, a, a part of the government's function. And that was a new concept. So today we take that for granted, that public education and public uh, funding of libraries, um, think of that. You're coming from a, a standpoint of libraries were a private enterprise, subscription-based, to an idea of a public library. That was an interesting shift. And groups of women, mostly, were the ones behind this, which I found very interesting. So we have this library, 1920, they do this, they go door to door, literally, to, to, uh, to get some, uh, people to, uh, uh, they were, had to be very careful because the, you know, you're not subscribing to the library, you're donating to the library. Um, you could become a member of the library, but that didn't mean that you, were the, you had exclusive rights to use the library when the library came into fruition. So you are supporting the library in order to make it open for all. So any donations you made to the library in 1920, the free library, um, this new organization that was formed, were to enable it to be open to everyone. So your donation didn't come with a, a string attached that you were that you would get entry into the library. The idea was that these folks would be donating for a community effort. So they donated to the library and they actually were able to, in 1920, they formed the library and opened in the Board of Trade. 
uh, soon outgrew it. And then an um, uh, interesting thing happened as they were trying to raise money um, for a new building or the concept of a new building. And Mrs. Griggs, Evelyn Griggs, uh, from Griggs and Ball, as we talked earlier, had donated the building that's at the corner of Main and, um, and Whaley Avenue. Now, this happened quite a bit. Um, in communities across the country. And it's quite interesting as I looked up, you know, libraries that have been named after people. And a lot of times they're named um, for women and even in our own area. So uh, out in uh, Cast Isle, there's the Cordelia Green Library. And it was named after her in honor of her because she donated uh, uh, the land. And of course, she has a whole story behind her if you want to Google Cordelia Green. Fascinating, fascinating woman, fascinating story. But she donated the money for the land, the building, and the books, and they named the library after her. Um, uh, the library in Chictawaga, the Julie Reinstein Library, um, same concept. Um, and But here in East Aurora, what I found interesting is that Mrs. Griggs uh, donated this building, um, a, a house that was existing, and uh, but there was a, a little notice in the newspaper about it with very few details. And then the library board came out, the committee came out a little later thanking her. But my sense is um, our library was not named for her, which is interesting since she donated the land and the building. Um, and she donated it in honor, in memory of her husband, Abbott Griggs, uh, who had passed away in 1917, but it's not the Griggs Library. So I thought that was interesting that she made the donation and um, but didn't necessarily, I don't know what the discussions were behind the scenes. I'd love to delve into the records more. But just from the records I've looked at so far, is it seemed like she didn't want the attention. Um, there was not there was no big splash in the newspaper. There was just a little tiny article and very few details when it was first announced that she donated the, the property. So um, it, it might be easy to forget that that donation was uh, made because, um, you know, when you go to the library in, in Cast Isle in Wyoming County, you're walking into the Cordelia Green Library. And here you're walking into the Aurora Public Library. It had gone from a free library to a public library and then is now part of the Erie County system. That's another story. But uh, but the idea, this happened in towns a around um, the country uh, where and even in big cities you'll see libraries and you'll see a name attached to it because East Aurora wasn't alone in this dilemma where we started free public libraries all of a sudden people started donating books like the library in the early days where the books were donated um, and then they ran out of space so the issue was you know we had a, a great library uh, and then we had needed bookshelves for the books that we had in the library. And then soon we were running out of space for all those bookshelves. And that's what happened in East Aurora. So someone would tend to come along and donate a building um, or land. And that, that pattern seemed to happen. Um, and ph philanthropists um, around that period of time, after World War I, um, and she had the money to do it, and she donated it. She was our, um, you know, the, the uh, she saw a need, and she filled that need. Um, and uh, that happened in a lot of towns. You'll have a wealthy family um, who would uh, donate to the, in a library. In many cases, though, they, there was sort of a understanding that the library would be named after them. You'll see that in big cities a lot. Um, that didn't happen here, which I found interesting. So we, um, there is a plaque in the lobby of the library. In fact, it was funny because when I was writing the article about um, Mrs. Griggs, I went to the library and I, I walked in and I swore I remembered seeing a plaque with her name on it. And so I walked in the library and I actually asked the great people at the library, you know, do you, uh, do you know where this plaque is? And they pointed to it. He walked right past it. I've been using the library for years and years and years. It's in the lobby and it's um, a plaque that uh, it talks about the library um, and be sure to look at it. It's a great plaque above the community bulletin board and it's, it talks about it, it honors Mrs. Griggs donation thanking her in honor of her husband. Um, now the library that's there now in the 1960s uh, replaced the original house that she donated but the fact that we have a centrally located library in the center of town was thanks to her. Um, and so um, in, so she was a big part of it, 
but I think also the reason maybe she uh, folks might have not named it after her sort of you know we named Hamlin Park after uh, Cicero Hamlin who donated the land for the community but I think in this case uh, perhaps she realized that this was a big community effort literally door-to-door -door campaign to raise the money um, they had a, 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 a big, um, uh, they called it a variety fair on the lawn of their new building in order to raise money in that summer of 1922 so they could open um, the library in the fall. So it wasn't just one person that the library belonged to. So I think that might be the reason why in our case here, um, uh, it's, a, it's the, pub, East Aurora, the Aurora Public Library. Um, and it belongs to everybody, not just Mrs. Griggs. So I, I think that was the right decision. But as we pass through the lobby, just kind of look up and look at that um, that plaque. Um, the advertiser didn't publish, we, the space constraints didn't publish the picture of the plaque, but I'll put that um, in the comments after we're done here. Um, just remember Mrs. Griggs. Um, and she was a supporter of the library for years uh, after... Um, after uh, she donated the library building. So she continued on being one of the volunteers that helped out. And again, these types of efforts um, just took a group of women, in this case, to get together, have an idea, and literally go door to door and made things something happen. So um, it really was a community effort for a free library. And remember, this was, they were, um, to convince people that a library was a good idea today would be an easy easier thing to do. Um, because we take for granted that the public library will be there to offer services. Um, back then, it, it wasn't. They actually found great success in um, one of the most successful programs that the uh, East Aurora Free Library had, uh, even before they acquired the property at Maine and Whaley, was the Children's Hour. And that was one of the main reasons that they had space constraints, is because they would have a children's reading program um, in this one room at the Board of Trade building, and they just couldn't fit all the kids who were coming. So preschool kids um, and getting children to learn to read earlier and introducing them to books that they may probably didn't have at home. So again, a free library open to all, including uh, children. So that was one other main reason why um, a building was necessary in order to have a children's section. And of course, children's programs are still part of the library. And um, so that's a, a hundred, more than a hundred year old um, program happening um, at our library. I promised I'd talk a little bit about book banning. Um, and there's one story that's quite interesting. Um, and it's not the public library um, that gets uh, involved here. So as I said, the school had a library before uh, the public library came along, the public free library. So there was a library at the high school. And Albert Hubbard, uh, there's a famous story of him donate, wanting to donate a collection of his writings and writings of his contemporaries and people he looked up to, to the school library. Now, previous um, accounts have said it was the village library. And so, so I started investigating, because I'm like, well, what village library is around in 1908? So this is what happened in 1908. And he wants to donate books to what they said was the village library. Well, in fact, it was the school library. So the Board of Education had control of this. And the State Education Department had become had come and become involved. And he um, highly publicized. He It was actually in the Easter Advertiser, a letter from him. He kept offering this collection of books. Um, he offered them to the school library. They refused them. Now, this was very political. And actually, Albert Hubbard's um, was a very controversial figure in East Aurora. Today we look up and talk about him in a different way, uh, but a lot of villagers in East Aurora um, did not like what he stood for. Um, he was very progressive, uh, had uh, leanings toward socialism, and a lot of people did not like that. So he offered the collection of books. Well, that was hugely controversial. The writings, what they were writing about, um, was, was deemed inappropriate uh, for, um, uh, for the library, particularly the school library. So he offers these books. He actually publishes his letter to the school board in the Easter Advertiser, goes back and forth. And in the end, the school board says, you know, they kind of got frustrated with him. And they say, said, well, we'll accept your books, but we're going to um, stick them in a separate section 
of objectionable literature. They were going to create a department of objectionable literature specifically for his books. So it was um, probably a little tongue-in-cheek how they were doing it. Um, but that my point with this story, and of course he writes all about this in his magazines, which have a uh, you know way more he was his magazines were huge the circulation of his magazines was huge so east aurora's debate with him his slant goes out to the world and it's his famous essay uh, uh, uh tempest in the village teapot published in 1908 and he where he talks about how the the village um he they won't accept his his writings and that he's not appreciated in his own town um and um it wasn't the village library that did this it was the school library um but uh an attempt to ban his books essentially from the library um and there was a huge controversy over it a lot of the controversy created by albert hubbard but that's what he did and that's what he enjoyed doing um and he got a lot of publicity out of it my point of bringing this up in addition to the fact that it's a really cool story um, and read, um, if you have the opportunity to read that essay ever, um, it was published in his magazine, um, uh, A Tempest in the Village Teapot. But the point of bringing that up is just that, you know, we talk about book banning today and we heard about it in, you know, 1930s and, but this has been going on for a long time. Um, and the, uh, the discussion of who gets to decide which books end up in the library and, um, and which books end up in the library has been a discussion for a long time. So it's not new. Um, uh, some folks feel like this is a new cultural battle we're dealing with and that school boards and library boards and library directors, um, uh, it does come keep coming back, but this is not a new debate. Um, the books are, the topics may be different, uh, but the books, um, the idea of who gets to pick which is in the library and people being objecting to what is in a library um, and trying to uh, create a policy of banning books um, for other people, uh, it, that's not a new concept. So in, in this case, uh, Albert Hubbard, that example um, of, of what was happening back then, um, it just goes to show that history is, you know, this is not new. And I, I sound like a broken record on that when we talk, but that's one of the things I like to do is uh, when people say, oh, this is unprecedented or the first time we've ever done this, no, there's always an example in the past that's either very close or exactly the same uh, of the discussions that we're having today. So um, that's just one story of uh, book banning, and it did happen in small towns across the country and, um, and, and here in East Aurora as well, a discussion of what could be in the library and what was appropriate. So uh, we're running out of time, and so if you have any comments or questions, thank you so much for putting them in there in the comments, or feel free to private message me. I know some people aren't comfortable sending it out to the for everyone to see. Um, but again, uh, thank you. Next time you're in the library, please check out the little plaque that's above um, the community board, and um, you know, and thank the Greeks uh, as you go by, and, and by extension, everybody, all the volunteers over the years who made our library free and open to all, so we could all learn and use its resources. Thanks, and have a great week. We'll see you next time.